Justiniak, and welcome to another episode of Positively Geared. Lloyd, it's great to be back in the studio. Uh, hasn't been too long between drinks this time. How are you today? Very well, Alex, and nice to be with you again. So let's get straight into it. Mitch and Mark, uh, I couldn't believe how long it's been. I actually had to check. September 2021, uh, we had you both last in the studio. Uh, obviously, we're super stoked to have you back with us. How have you guys been? We've been great, but when you say September 21, that does seem like eternity ago. There's a lot happened since then in our lives and in the market. It's been pretty crazy ride. What do you and say, there's Mark? a lot that's happened in the world. Yeah. It's <laughs> so I long know. ago. Yeah. But it's nice to be back. Well, we won't say the big C word, the one yes. which uh, ends in D to clarify for our listeners. Um, yes. Mitch just looked, you looked perplexed then, Mitch. By yeah, I was, which t- C I, word. You, you threw, I was wondering what was going on. You too, threw me. <laughs> I thought, wow, let's go there right away, hey? <laughs> that, was the, that was the hot topic back in 2021. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say the world is all keeping us on our toes. You know, it's definitely an interesting time for property uh, and the world in a broader sense. So I'm really keen to hear, last time we had you both here, uh, you'd just moved to the Northern Beaches. How's life treating you in God's country? It's been incredible. We moved out here in December 2019. Um, we didn't plan to live there. We, just, we were just testing out our new purchase of a beach house to see what we wanted to do with it. And we decided we wanted to stay and we planned to renovate it, potentially flip it. But instead, we, life got in the way. We went and we well, we finished the block, and then we did. We've got a, a homeware store, Mitch and Mark Home, which is online, and um, so you can buy goods from us in Spain or wherever you are in the world. Um, and uh, we've uh, done another show called Location, Location, Location Australia. So we've been busy, and our house is still badly in need of a renovation. The only thing we can say is that we have started on. The, the back garden and the staircase. So our property goes three levels or probably four levels. Four, Mitch, levels, from the four levels down the side of a cliff, which is not unusual in Newport and in the Northern Beaches. And we had to extend the staircase to access the garden out the back. And we're doing some landscaping down there. So that's the first step. Yeah, anything you do in gardens with the big with the views in the beaches, they tend to be um, extensive because sloping blocks cost money yes. to make them pretty. Yeah. I think sloping blocks cost money to do anything on, oh, uh, whether you're, um, you're building on them, uh, you're putting a driveway on them, putting a swimming pool in them or on them or, or doing anything you want. So, um, But yeah, it sounds like you've really got something happening there with that and um, obviously been keeping you very busy the last couple of years. Yeah, we have. I, You know, we've had an amazing ride. I guess we never thought that we would be on a journey, the journey that we have been on. And we're very appreciative for what we've been able to do. But we've loved also sharing some of the experience with the people that we've met along the way. It's been a pretty wild ride. And um, as Mike said, something we never expected. Um, I do want to come back to the backyards at some stage, though, when we start talking about properties for renovation and for flipping. Mm. So the last time we were here, September 21, was before the auction, the block auction which we eventually won, which was a complete surprise. But when we looked back on it, there were reasons and indicators that that property probably performed better. It's just we didn't see it at the time, that that property performed better than the other properties on the block. So, um, yeah, we've been very lucky. So getting with that um, that property that you had on the block, what were those indicators and what do you think made that property stand out and that was really successful? And I absolutely loved, I must say, I, I watched that. I absolutely loved watching both of you, um, you know, perform on the block, but I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts on, on why that property did so well. In a, in a nutshell, um, it was inside the cul-de-sac. So the property that Ronnie and Georgia had was on the corner with a busy road. So out, the wrong property. Kirsty and Jesse had a a double sized block um, with a big house on it. Well, it wasn't that big, but they raved about how big it was. But the block should have been split up. It was too big, so that one's ruled out because it was um, the, it was never going to achieve the money it needed to 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 get enough over reserve. Then there was um, Vito and Tanya's and the twins, Luke and Josh's properties. Well, the boys did a shit floor plan. Um, and Vito and Tanya's house was very mid-century modern, so it, and and they really honed in on that. So you limited your buyers, and yeah. it was only three bedrooms. Yeah. So ours was the only four-bedroom house. The floor plan was a killer. 
it looked like it belonged in the street because it was a cottage style and that's what's popular in the area. So it had all the indicators that it should win. But the block is an unusual beast though in that our first season, there was a house that Luke contested and it, and it, it was, they did a crap job and it won. So the block is, I, I don't think you could use the block as any measure of, of the right property wins. Mm. In our case, we were lucky we won it um, and it was the house that probably should have won. But it's not always the case on the block. It, it, it's it's a lot of hype. and There is. But I think there are some principles when we look back on that that you think about when you're selling a property or flipping a property. To me, the floor plan is the most important. And we've been looking and watched, well, we look at a lot of properties like you, and we've also watched some of the last couple of episodes, seasons of the block. We haven't watched a lot of it. We don't like the, what do you call it? The mean girl Bitching. stuff. We don't, we do not believe that that's appropriate on TV and particularly as role models for young people. That is not what this is supposed to be about in our view. So we haven't watched a lot of it, but we actually have looked at floor plans. And when, and I think, I think, you, Mitch, I think you're probably the same. When you're looking at a property, first thing I look at is how is the property laid out and what is the floor plan? It, it doesn't matter what color the wall is. It doesn't matter because you can change that sort of stuff, but it has to work for a family. And for us, when we looked back on our house in Bronte Court, it also had to fit in with what was the style in that, in that area. And for whatever reason, you know, we had actually done research. We had walked around that whole suburb. Remember, Mitch, we yeah. went walking all the time to look at what are the gardens like, what are the facades like, you know, what is somebody wanting when they live in that area? And then how do you put that into the floor plan? And when we looked back on the 2021 season, the boys in the house at the end of the cul-de-sac should have won that. They should absolutely have won that season but they changed the floor plan up and they stuffed up their market. Now, we've we've said that to them. Remember, Mitch, we talked to them one yeah. time and said, look, in our view, you gave up the win and it was because your floor plan. You changed things and made it worse. And they were like, no, 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 we did the right thing. So you didn't do the right thing. People don't live the way you designed that house. So to us, that's, that's more important, I think, than whether somebody styled – a sofa in a certain way or a painting that's the icing on the cake once you get the floor plan right well if you look because you look at the house that ronnie and george presented george's styling is just impeccable it's beautifully done but those guys can't put a floor plan together the floor plan was a disaster they, by the looks of what they presented on the outside they don't they didn't understand the market they presented a big white box very mod very minimal sterile type garden and a bizarre fence and it, and it just and it just didn't look pretty, which it needed to be pretty in that area. Yeah. The floor plan didn't work. So no matter, no matter how beautiful the styling was that Georgia put into the place, yes. that they were doomed before they before they laid a cushion on a, on a it couch. Was, it was the elements there, I think, that were an issue. So people think about houses and selling. The house had a glass door that when you walked up to the front of the house, you looked straight to the kitchen. Now, no one wants to look at the kitchen from the front of the house. The master bedroom and the kids' bedrooms were at the front of the house where when cars are driving into a cul-de-sac, the first thing that hits is the lights on the windows. You don't want that with young kids. And even the external, the exterior of it, all the services, the hot water and everything was on the external side that you could see from the road. So it's things like thinking about the exterior and the interior. And then with the floor plan that you had to cross, you had to, you had to cross over from the bedrooms through the living room to the kitchen and to the laundry. Kind of want to think about that. If you've got the choice to put a floor plan together, you want to make sure that your utility services mm. don't mean you have to walk through your living areas yes. to get to them. You, you, yeah. you want to have a flow and they had an opportunity to have a flow. They got carried away as you can do on the block. You get carried away with trying to do rooms that win with the judges. Because if you, if you win rooms, you get money. Mm. So you've either got to work out how you can do the best plan without winning mm. or go for the wins and then risk auction day being yeah. a flop. Yeah, you mentioned some really interesting things there because when I'm buying properties for my clients, um, one of the first things I look at is um, yes. you know, the street appeal. So buying in a quiet street or a cul-de-sac is really, really important. You know, would never buy on a busy road. So looking at that um, that aspect from the outside and then... Uh, and then you've also mentioned the, like, the, the demographics. So, you know, is, is this area appropriate for a three-bedroom or a four-bedroom? You know, what do the demographics of the area dictate for people to live in? But uh, you're so right. There's often people that are a bit emotional that 
uh, that they'll turn away from a property because it's got pink walls or you know there's something something aesthetically they don't like about it but you can change that yep. particularly if their strategy as many of our clients are to to maybe renovate to add some value or to, to flip the property but they'll still be turned off by something but the floor plan as you say is just so important it's got to be functional um so you know i'll walk into a property and then see that the bathroom makes no sense to where that is in um in relation to where the bedrooms are or something and then you know i'll be turned off straight away um you know for a reason like that um or we might look at that and think, okay, we can renovate the property uh, and do something with that if that's a strategy. Or if we're buying just as a an investment property, if the floor plan doesn't work, we might just walk out and uh, and source another property. Uh, you know, if it doesn't work, so there's there's those sort of things that are, you know just so important. And I think uh, the things that you guys are looking for, uh, you know, just relate so well to generally what makes a good good investment property and for what a lot of a lot of buyers looking for investments sh- sh- you know should really be looking for. It's interesting, Lloyd, you talk about the street appeal. To me. Um it's all the steps you take getting into the house that set the set you in the right mind frame. If the garden looks beautiful and it feel and it's beautiful to walk through, and then the front door is a nice front door to approach, then you walk in and you feel something, some some emotion when you open the front door. If all that feels great, you can actually get away with bathrooms, which are the big cost to fix. You can get away with bathrooms that are okay. If you're if you're mm putting all your emphasis on putting in beautiful new new bathrooms, like the place we're in has five bathrooms. Mm. To do That's five awesome. bathrooms, it's going to cost you in this current day, it's probably going to cost you 40 grand per bathroom. Huge expense. Mm. But do we look at making the place feel beautiful and alluring and a- attack all its features before we get to the bathrooms and save some money there? So they're sort of the mm. concern. I think that the, every step on the way in is what sets you in the right mind frame to buy a property or not buy a property. And we've written a couple of articles about what's the thing that sells a home. And people often talk about, oh, kitchens. Kitchens sell homes. And Mitch, you wrote about this. It's the curb appeal, the first thing that you see. That actually sells the home. Yes, people want kitchens. And if it's going to be a horrible kitchen, you can't ignore that the first thing you see from the curb that starts to make connect with the buyer and that starts to create their desire to want to live there. And that's what you did on that block house. That's what you created on that one. We were actually asked to write our opinion on the recent season, the 2023 season's front yards, and whether we thought the judging got it right with the front yard. And we said, well, we don't think that it did because the one that was given the win didn't create that emotional feel and didn't connect with the house. I think they misunderstood what the purpose of that Made for a better story than winning the front yard though. Yeah, True. But uh, the thing I love though about property and you were talking about floor plan is uh, to look at a house or a home and think there's a private space and there's almost a public space. There's a space where you entertain and you have the family gathers or friends come. The sharing space. space. What's that? The sharing space. The sharing space. And if your floor plan enables that to be separate – so you can access the private living space without walking through the, the public space, like Mitch referenced. And when you looked at Ron and George's floor plan, there was no way to get to the bedrooms without walking straight through the living room. We don't want that. We don't want a plan that forces you to walk through the living area all the time because you want to have a lifestyle that is like a separate from that noise. I want to be able to have that time and have the kids in their room and everyone's happy. I was super keen to unpack with you both. You know, it really hit home with me. Um, From my experience in the real estate world, blocks of land, good street frontage, whether that's a nice wide block, you know, dual street appeal, it is truly irreplaceable when you buy a property. You know, you're always bound by those core attributes, unless, of course, you've got more money to buy the adjacent lot. So my question is, if you were both looking at a property today to renovate and honed in on everything you learned on the block and in between, since we last had you in the studio. How can we help our listeners differentiate between, okay, we're looking at a block of land or an established home that needs some love, cosmetic versus structural? Because the floor plan, I agree, is absolutely critical. In fact, it's the building block of any great home. But I do think some mum and dad investors might walk into a property and depending on the amount of work needed may go into a state of overwhelm. So how important is it to get the floor plan where you want it? And if it's not where you want it to be, How can they explore options which may help them unlock the potential, you know, obviously conscious of budget and experience? Um, I think in this current market, I personally would be looking for cosmetic renovation properties. The cost of 
trades and the availability of products and trades is so poor right now. Um, I think cosmetic renovations have got a lot to offer. That's at the current time, at this current time, and who knows what, what what's coming. We don't know what's coming. We don't know whether the market's going to continue to creep up or whether it's going to stagnate or whether it's even going to drop. And we've, we've been scratching our head for the last year in particular, expecting the market to drop, and it hasn't. So I think if you're looking at big renovations, you're really incurring big risk. So I think if you wanted to flip properties or invest in properties, I think at the moment I would be edging towards cosmetic renovations. We're in that position now with the property that we're living in. It's, it's, it's huge. It's too big for us We've, and we need to fix it, but we need to, to assess how far do we go. Now that we're in houses, which we used to always be in apartments, you really need to consider the block of land. Like our block of land compared to a flat block is going to cost hundreds of thousands more just to make it somewhat usable and somewhat attractive as opposed to a flat block where you can put a few trees and put in a bit of lawn and you can make it Mm. somewhat attractive. Yeah, and you don't want to go into a property, well, I think you don't want to go into a house where you go, I need to add living space to that house because then you've got to go through the whole DA process. So if you're wanting, I think, to add value is to do it as a compliance certificate, development certificate. So you're working within the bounds of the existing structure and you can get certifiers involved. You don't have to go through DAs. That's going to add time and money. So as Mitch said, if you want to flip, and our guy idea had always been you want to flip in the same market. So you want to get your renovation done really quickly if you're doing it that way to sell. And I agree with Mitch, then you want to do cosmetic changes Ideally, you want properties, as you were saying, Lloyd, that somebody walks into and goes, oh my God, it's a pink wall. I can't deal with that because that's really easy to deal with. But most people can't see it. Those are the ideal ones because it's paint or it's styling or it's furniture or it's re-sanding floors. I think, as Mitch said, you know, there's been a lot of builders who've gone out of business in the last little while, in the last few years, which is concerning because that puts pressure on the market to be able to get trades and to be able to get supplies. And the supply chains have been really difficult. In fact, Mitch, you and I probably put off doing any work on our house for a couple of reasons, but one of those was, why would you do it now if you don't have to, because it's going to cost you more? And it was just materials have skyrocketed and supply has been very difficult. I think, Mitch, if you go into anything where you want to move walls, then you need to see, is it masonry? Is it stud wall? Asbestos. If it's Asbestos. Asbestos is another issue. It's like once you scrape underneath that wall, you need to think about what is it you're going to find. That's not to say that you can't do that. But I think, Mark, we've we've got to consider if you're going for your forever home, and people talk about a forever home, and generally Mm. it's not forever, it's for for seven to ten years but if you're going for your for your forever home knock us about spend the money because the market will will save will yep. save your butt in the long run anyway so yep. if you spend more money to make it perfect for you and you get 10 years out of the home great but if you if you're thinking this is a step where it would be like a maximum of five years mm-hmm. you really got to be careful because we do see people add on add on things to suit themselves or change to suit themselves yep. and then they expect to get all that money back plus That's right, an yeah. increase, and it, it's but, it, but it doesn't suit people, the market. It just suits them. And some people will, if you're looking to, I think if you want to buy, so as an investment, you want to rent it out, get a family in. So some people will go and look at a property and go, oh, I could make it look beautiful and I could put tiles here and do this and do whatever else. You're going to rent it out. The things I would be thinking about, who is the market? Who are the people who live in this area? So who are you going to be marketing this to? What's your access in and out of the property? If it's a young family, they're going to have kids, they're going to have prams. You don't want a house that's got lots of stairs. You know, it's those sorts of things you think about first. And then, Mitchy, I think we were doing that. We've got a couple of investment properties, but I would just go paint it all white. Use paint, use very simple things, re-carpet. Don't spend heaps of money on finishes and styling because you love doing it, that's great, but it's not going to work. No, that's right. And that's actually, you just answered the next question I was going to ask you was what sort of things you'd look to do in a cosmetic renovation. But would you have any kind of a figure to put on that? Like a percentage of the purchase price of an investment that you might put on um, some cosmetic renovations or something like that? I, I think it's I think it's a hard one, Lloyd, because it all, every cosmetic renovation has different requirements. If the house is a total dog's breakfast and it's very ugly on the outside and it needs to be rendered, um, you'll spend a lot more making beautifying the outside as well as the inside, mm. which is still relatively cosmetic. 
but it might add another hundred grand to your cosmetic renovation. So I, I think it's it's really a case by case thing mm. on on what mm. each home really needs to get it to that stage where you get all the joy factors kicking in from curb to front door to inside mm. before you reach that kitchen, whether it's beautiful or average. Yeah. So I'm um, back to the beautiful kitchen. If everything's not ticking the boxes on the way in and you've got this magnificent kitchen, then they get to the kitchen and they think, oh, well, the kitchen's at least lovely, rather than getting all the way through thinking, oh, my God, and the kitchen's good too. <laughs> but the other thing I guess I would be thinking, and, and it's hard, it is hard because there are so many conditions. There's so many, oh, but in this circumstance, I'd do one thing in another circumstance. Let's say you're buying an investment property and you said, I want to rent it out. My plan is to have it for 10 years. At the end of 10 years, you want to sell it. Let's say, realize the growth that you've had in there. To rent it out, you have to look at what are you providing to your tenant because you want to, well, I think you want to have a good tenant and you want to keep a good tenant. Every time you turn over a tenant, it's costing you money. And Mitchie, we've had investment properties where, say through COVID, we went to, through our agent, to the tenant and said, if you have any issues because COVID is impacting your ability, do not do anything. Talk to us first. We want to keep you because it's it's just low maintenance. It's You get a good tenant, mm. it's easy. So you want to present a property that people would like to be in. It doesn't mean you want to do a block finish. You don't want to do that, but you want something that is presentable and nice that maintains them for a period of time. If you want to keep it safe for 10 years and sell it, you have to be realistic that at that point before selling it, you're going to have to redo carpets, redo bathrooms. Do you want to do that earlier or do you want to do it later? If you have to do it earlier, then you want to do it on a budget. You're not going to do high-end finishes, but you're going to make it functional and beautiful. So white tiles, you know, that kind of stuff. You can do that and then plan in your, I guess, in your model, in your business model that come eight years, my plan is to have for 10 years, about year eight or year nine, I'm going to have to do some renovation work. And that's going to cost me a certain amount of money. I think it also comes down to what your plan is for that property. In Not just, like you said, Mark, in terms of how long you're holding it, but also, you know, if you're buying a property and you want to um, create mm -hmm. some equity on it because you're looking to maybe refinance mm -hmm. that property to help you get into another property, then your purpose of doing renovation might yes. be to increase its value. So you might be looking to do that. Uh, you might be buying the property to sell at a profit, but that obviously becomes a bit trickier depending on uh, yeah, the circumstances, how much the property is, mm -hmm. what the market's doing. Or you might be buying property to uh, to increase the rental on it, of course, that you're going to hold for the long term. So it does depend on, on your strategy. Uh, but getting back to what you said about um, keeping the property in good condition, I actually tend to do that with all my properties and I, I'll paint them um, you know, from time to time, even without the tenant asking for it, because I think it's important to keep the tenant happy. And I've got um, some of my properties where I've had the same tenant for over 10 years. So um, so it's really important just to look after them. And during COVID, there were a couple of those tenants who uh, I think were paying about half their, their rent for that time. But uh, I mean, I you know, kept them happy and we all sort of all worked together. And because, you, you know, it is about being in the interest of trying to keep people happy over the long term. And I think that on that note of, of keeping tenants happy, if you're looking at a long-term investment for a tenant of property, it's so important to have either an, a desirable building a really sought after location. One of our rental properties, particularly the one in Brisbane, Mark, that any time a tenant leaves, for us, it's an opportunity to go back to the waiting list of people who want to be in that. It's a very luxury mm. building. So we've, we've never, ever had a gap. Literally, they go back to the to the waiting list of people who want to get into the building and we, ch and we choose the tenant we want, which is a very luxurious position to be in. Uh, whereas if we're in one of the adjacent buildings, not so mm. popular, um, not such a great view. They're going to then fight the market to get a tenant in. And and every time you have a property that's struggling to get a tenant, it's a really long time to catch up that, that yeah. lost rent and, mm. and the return the property delivers you, even on, sa on the sale. If you have a property for five years and you have in that period vacant for a month every year, yeah. it sort of does hurt the long the long. And game. I think Mitch, part of that long game too is if you need to do maintenance and you're maintaining an asset. So it's like you're looking after, you've got something that you love at home, you've bought, you love this thing. This is the same thing. You're maintaining it. You need to keep it in good, good condition, which also means that if you have things that go wrong, we've had people email our property manager, say, oh, the dishwasher's broken or whatever. So just fix it, just get it done because we want to look after them. So I think it's also an attitude that you have. And I get a bit frustrated when I read and hear a negative attitude towards landlords 
all landlords are trying to rent us off. It's it's a power game. It's actually, in our view, for us, it's not because yes, we've got investment properties that's offering accommodation, that's offering a home to people, and we want to maintain those people. So it's like a symbiotic relationship. We both have to look after each yeah. other. No, I agree. And most property investors are actually just mum and dad investors yes. who are trying to get ahead. So it's not about people trying to rip no. um, anybody off. Uh, they're just trying to have an asset to put themselves and their family in a better position. Uh, and I, um, you know, like I uh, essentially do the, do the same and really trying to look after, uh, you know, the, the tenants over the, you know, the long period, keep people happy and, and everything like that, because it's, it's really important. You know, you do see everybody's um, you know, point, point of view there. And I, uh, I do get frustrated as well when, um, you know, when people think that, you know, landlords are trying to rip people off. And I think when, you know, when something happens in, in one of my investment properties, whether the dishwasher's broken or there's a leaking tap, I just tell the landlord straight yep. away, just get it fixed. I don't even ask for a quote if it's, if it's just something basic like that. It's just say, just get, get it fixed. Because I know I don't want to be living in my home if something's not working or if something's not working, my <laughs> wife will be at uh, my case and saying, you know, Honey, just get this fixed. Why, why is this still yeah. not fixed? Yeah. So yeah. I know that uh, my tenants would not be, want to be yeah. in that situation either. So therefore, you want them to be living in the same sort of conditions, which is um, yeah, everything working. And I think you properly. also want them to feel that you're invested and you're looking after them. Put yourself in their place. If they feel like they have to beg, steal and borrow to get something fixed, and you know that's being re- you want people to be reasonable. It's not about being unreasonable. But if you don't respond, why would they look after your asset? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think it should be a two-way street. Yeah, and um, and and I think that's it's, it's very fair. If you if you look after them, they will um, yeah generally respond um, back well. And and I look, I've I've had tenants who have actually requested if they can do painting themselves at their own. Um, expense or can they plant some of their own you know plants in the in the garden at the back and things like that and uh, because and that just shows that they want to be there for the long term and I and I always um, you know abide mm. by that and and, I, and approve those sort of things because I think that uh, shows goodwill on both parts. There's been a lot of talk with the rental shortage and and rents going up along with that there's been interest rate rises and you know, there's been some negative talk about landlords jacking up rents because because they can, but by the same token, I think that's been a little bit harsh on a lot of the landlord, landlords, like you said, mum and dad landlords who own these properties. The interest rates have gone up. They have to pay the mortgage. Um, so they have to get more rent to pay the mortgage because in, mo- in many cases, if they're just people like us, we don't have the extra money necessarily to, to cop an extra interest rate rise. Like when, when through, through the COVID days, when when there was all the pressure to reduce rents to keep people in, to p- keep people in, that was all well and good. But we we had friends who were struggling to get by because they were relying on their rent mm. to pay their mortgage of this investment mm. property, and there was all the pressure on them to reduce their rent. By the same token, the banks weren't saying, "Hey, take it yeah. easy, don't worry about yeah, it." That's right. We'll, re- we'll reduce yeah. your yes. payments. But but that's exactly right. People do uh, have to still. Um, pay their rents, uh, or, or you know, the the landlords still have to pay their yeah, mortgages, mortgages yeah. Um, with these interest rates going up. So, uh, so that's a, that's a really good point um, there, Mitch. And the other thing also is it's not just the uh, yeah the landlords and the mum and dad investors who are coming forward and trying to jack their rents. It's also really the property managers mm. who are doing that and advising that this is what the market's doing. This is this is market rent as well. So often the landlords aren't really doing anything, but they've been advised that this is what yes, uh, yes. the rental um, yeah, for the for the areas and stuff anyway. So so there's a lot of harsh treatment yeah. um, around that as well. Lloyd, we've been talking a lot about buying in different states being a real focus for your business at the moment. Um, Mitch and Mark, super keen to get your take on this. A lot of mum and dad investors are now looking outside of their community and even in some respects outside of their city. And, you know, it's a really interesting conversation around purchasing based on data versus physically going to inspect a property. You know, walking through the street, getting a sense of the block position, where the light sits in the afternoon. What's your experience with that? Have you ever bought a property without having had a look at it in person? And, you know, is that something you'd recommend um, for or against? Um, We have got a property in Brisbane that I mentioned that we bought off a plan. So the building wasn't there to even to, to check out, but I knew, I knew the area it's, it's um, in Vulture street, right on the river in Brisbane. And I knew the area. Well, I've spent a lot of time up there. I was familiar. We were, we were very reluctant to buy 
out interstate. We looked at Melbourne. We looked at, at Brisbane. We weren't keen. And we have done so probably 10 years ago. Probably, now, yeah. um, Very successfully. But I wouldn't necessarily say I would recommend it because we could have got it wrong. Mm. We could have got it wrong. We, we, were, we were very lucky and we had a, a bit of market knowledge and we understood what the building that was going in represented as uh, was to be a luxury building sought after, hard to get into. So we kind of knew a bit about it. Properties in, in Melbourne that we may have bought, I think could have been a big mistake because the, the market down there in close to the city became saturated, whereas where we bought, it's on the river, so it can't, it can't be built out. I, I just I think it has its risks. We've all, we have always looked at buying properties where we know the market mm-hmm. inside mm-hmm. out. And we haven't had to rely on third parties to give us feedback on, on a market. And I think it's very hard to replicate a really in-depth market knowledge of an area. It is. I think Mitch is right. We wanted to buy an investment. We had a, fa- a financial advisor who happens to be a really good friend of ours. I, we were friends when we were teenagers, so I've known him for a long time. And we wanted an investment property. He put forward a couple of options with reputable builders. But like a lot of people, buying off the plan, we like, Oh, we're scared of that. We've never done that. What if it doesn't work? Mitch, we had a friend in Perth who did that where a sunset clause was invoked because they were trying to take the properties back and resell them because the market had boomed in in Perth, remember? And they were trying yeah. to, the developer was trying to make more money. So we were anxious about it. But what we did is we researched the cities. And Mitch is right. Remember, we looked at Melbourne and went, there is so much development going on in that inner city area. There's going to be a glut of apartments. So we figured rental will be down. But we also looked at Brisbane and said, well, it's on the East Coast. It's got a great lifestyle, sunny climate. It was developing. And Mitch, you did a lot of research talking to the developer, but we got a connection with somebody who used to be with that developer and no longer worked there. And he talked to you about a property, a market within a market. And so location was important for us in Brisbane and doing that research. And so far in 10 years, I've never walked inside that property once and it's never been vacant. So our advice is um, we did it, it worked. We wouldn't necessarily back the theory though. Lloyd, I'm keen to get you to tell me about your point of view and, and recent experience looking into different regions and states. I know for you it's been, it's been very important to have feet on the ground and have a proper inspection of a property, which is to say not just relying on the data points. Yeah, so when I was growing my portfolio, I actually bought quite a few properties without ever seeing them. Uh, I think some of them worked well uh, just by accident. Obviously, some research was involved. And I think some of them I probably bought in markets where the markets just didn't um, perform so well. Again, I researched the markets, but, you know, it's like you look at the research and the data and then things don't go as well mm-hmm. as you think. Um, I've got a, a off-the-plan property in Brisbane as well, which I've had almost 10 years. So I've, I've been there and done that as well. Again, um, I'm always very careful in, in recommending that. I, I never recommend that to, sort of um, property to, to my clients, but there's a place for that, um, but being careful about it. But in terms of... Uh, these days, uh, I think it's really important that um, that you do inspect properties. But if you're, you know, you're based on the East Coast and then you happen to be buying in Perth uh, uh, because that's where it's booming or you want to buy in South Australia or even if you want to buy in Brisbane, I think if you inspect it yourself, then it's important that uh, someone does uh, inspect it who's actually working for you. That's what we try to do, obviously, as a buyer's agent. So I don't think you can just rely on on the selling agent to uh, to tell you that it's a good property. Yeah. But I think uh, if when we're looking at it, we can then provide you the uh, the commentary around it and the videos. I think that's an important point, Mitch. You've talked a lot to people that we've assisted, and we're not buyers agents, but we've assisted people. You've made the point to buyers, the real estate agent there is to sell for the vendor. So they're doing their job. Their job is to get the best price possible for the person or the company selling that isn't about giving you the best deal. They're just doing their job. Well, we've often had people say to us, oh, the agents you know, the agents are so slack, they're not looking after me. And I said, well, that's not their job to look after you. It's their job to look after the person they're selling for. Yes. They represent them first. So, so that I guess by way of saying somebody like a buyer's agent, somebody who can look for you is important. Don't just rely on what the agent, and that's not saying it. That's not having a go at agents. Agents are doing the job that they're paid to do. They're paid to sell. To build on that, I think the biggest pitfall, at least in my experience, by relying solely on data, 
is that data accuracy is a highly discussed topic. And, you know, data can typically lag behind the real world. Um, now, that could be by a week, a couple of weeks mm-hmm. or a month, which in reality doesn't seem like a long period of time, but things can change and shift so quickly, you know, particularly depending on time of year, what's happening in the world or the economy. I'm a big believer that the data should be there to assist in that decision-making process, but definitely having somebody, you know, able to be there by your side in your corner, as you guys have rightfully just said, or at the very least, at least getting on site yourself and getting a sense of whether the property feels right or not to you. Like uh, Sydney as a whole, it just trends up and up. Uh, Melbourne's probably pretty steady too, but when you look at Perth and regions in Queensland, they can be so impacted by mining and give a false sense of a market incredibly increasing, but also that mar- those markets have had the crashes too. When we bought in Brisbane, I was so mindful that we didn't want to be buying in an area that was going to be attracting mining investment. We bought right in Brisbane because I thought right in Brisbane on the river, it was going to attract locals who want to be on the river with a great view. Yeah, lifestyle driven. Yeah, and I just yeah. think when people go for areas where that are particularly impacted by mining, setting yourself up for potential fail. I think there's another element around inspecting the property. It's not just about the property, but getting back to what we were talking before about street appeal, it's about looking at what's really happening in the street. Yeah. I mean, with data, one of the things I like to look for in a property is having an area that's about 80% owner-occupied, 20% uh, renters. So you know you're buying into a a good area. So the data can tell you that. But when you go to an area, rather than just looking at the the property you're buying, really looking, you know, yeah. I have uh, been to areas that I thought that it was a really good area I was buying into, and then found out yeah. that the the house next door had four noisy dogs, mm. and yes. then also found out that legislation didn't even permit that many dogs to be in the property and things like that. Data doesn't tell you that, and then mm-hmm. you know you don't want to find out that someone's growing a drug lab next to the house you're trying to buy, and, and all these sort of things. So there are things about uh, actually going to an area and finding that out that research can't actually tell you. Only other thing I think from what We've experienced when if people aren't used to buying a lot, they don't realise they need to move fast. And that isn't making quick decisions or poor decisions. It's, Mitchie, we've had that with people. And they go, oh, well, I'll wait until they get back to me and I put an offer in. Keep the pressure on the vendor. Keep the pressure on the real estate. Take control of the process. Have everything lined up and make sure that you're driving it forward. Don't just sit back. We've had people say, Oh, I put an offer in, I never heard anything. Well, do something. Don't just sit back. Yeah. You know, there were a lot of innocent mum and dad purchases, and I say this through no fault of their own. And with all our listeners as my witness, I will say they were never taken advantage of. <laughs> <Why>? um, yeah. <laughs> but you kind of do get a sense really quickly oh. <laughs> who those more astute purchases are. You know, who's on their second or third purchase. And the way that I tell this is from the kind of questions they ask and the type of questions they ask. You know, how they bring themselves into the deal rather than waiting for the deal to come to them. It's a real learned skill. Mm. And I also think that's the whole thing about having yourself armed with information, regardless whether you have Lloyd helping you or, or are talking to Mark and I. You need to do your own homework. You need to be able to have a very active conversation with Lloyd about why, why he's guiding towards property and, understand, and un- then you can understand the reasoning um, instead of just saying, okay, Lloyd, show me the property you think you think is right for me. And then it turns out that Lloyd didn't know that they had two fat children from another marriage that they never talked about, but then they need to accommodate them. You need to know all the crap. There's a lot of that stuff that has actually come up before. Um, I mean, one example, I was actually buying for someone uh, and then we found this perfect home for them. And then it was actually mm. um, facing um, the wrong direction from a cemetery and found out that they're, they're, for religious reasons, it, it didn't suit yeah. them. Um, they didn't let me know that in the first place. So mm. we now have this very extensive wish list that we ask for up front yeah. to make sure that we cover off absolutely everything that I need to know before we go on with the search. So Mitch and Mark, it's been really great to have you join us today. Uh, I, think, I think we need you both as a permanent fixture on the show simply because there's so much to talk about and, and never enough time. I am keen though to know before we finish up, a, so what's next in store for you both? And, and B, when when can we see you both again? What's next? You know what? We actually don't know, which is quite exciting. We for, Since 2019, we changed our lives. We left the corporate world and we did the blocker game. We opened a store. We've done location, 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 which they haven't renewed at this point. We don't know if they will. 
but we really don't want know what's next. And it's quite exciting. We're, we're in a position of luxury where we can afford mm. a bit of a buffer. No, I do know one thing that's next. But we don't know what's next. No, we're going to be staining a staircase. Europe, yeah. Three stories of wooden external Four staircase. Stories. <laughs> Four stories. <laughs> Four stories. So um, the immediate thing, though, is we are starting work on our house, which is great. It's not going to be a huge, we're not doing a huge big reno because we're thinking strategically about the property. So this is the one that you delayed and now you're finally yes. doing it. This is the one that's been so delayed. This was yeah. COVID delayed, block delayed, location delayed, us delayed. But now now that's the next thing on our agenda. But guys, thank you so much for having us. And I do feel like we've been fence sitters a bit today because I think this market is like a market we've never seen before. Mm. So there's a lot of I could do, I could do, I should do, but we really don't know what. It's, um, but it's been fa- absolutely fantastic having you both here. Absolutely love having a chat as always. And you guys bring so much knowledge and experience and I know our listeners always appreciate it. Well, thank you for having us back. We had a great time. Thanks, guys. 